Grab a seat. Thanks, team. Amazing. And thanks for everybody in youth who were involved in the service and have been so far. It's been great. What a great week we've had in the life of the church. I don't know how you are with sports. I love sports and... Uh, what I find is that in conversations about sports, there's a, an argument that often comes up, and that is, who was the greatest of all time? Who was the greatest? If you think of basketball, who was the greatest of all time? Was it Michael Jordan or LeBron James? Arguments, arguments. When it comes to golf, who was the greatest of all time? Was it Jack Nicholas, Tiger Woods? When it comes to football, who was the greatest? Was it Pelé? Messi? Ronaldo? Crove. Maradona? When it comes to tennis, who was the greatest? I tell you one place where there's no argument. It's not to do with sports. But as Christians, there should be no argument about the greatest sermon of all time. The greatest sermon of all time was Jesus, his sermon on the mount. You can find it in the Bible, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. The greatest sermon of all time, that's the title of my message today. Not this sermon, Jesus' sermon. <laughs> Big shout out, by the way, to everybody in Rotterdam and Brussels. Good to have you with us. The Sermon on the Mount, the depth of wisdom, the depth of truth, and yet so countercultural, completely countercultural. When it was spoken for the first time, it, was, it went completely opposite to the culture of the day. And still today, it's completely opposite to the culture of the day. And every generation in between, it's been completely opposite to the generation of the day, yet it stood the test of time. It is spoken about, it is quoted every week in churches all around the world, every day in hundreds, probably thousands of people's minds and words, his sermon is quoted. I mean, in the Western world, you've got some great speeches. Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream, pretty great speech. Winston Churchill, Never Give Up, pretty great speech. But none of them come close, in my opinion, to Jesus' sermon on the mount. And the reason that you see it with so much depth and wisdom, yet countercultural, is it shows us how far we have gone from the way God originally intended it to be. It becomes obvious almost immediately. And it's like an upside down world. I don't mean his sermon, I mean the one we live in. The world we live in is completely upside down compared to the Sermon on the Mount. The world, see the world is so much about self, self-esteem, self-image, self-confidence, self-reliance, self-protection, self-promotion, self-determination, self-absorbed, self-reliant, self-interests, self-made, arrogance, all about personal prosperity. All about myself. It's a self-centered way of life which becomes selfish. Jesus, however, speaks about the blessing and the real life that comes from surrendering self, humbling self, serving others and letting love reign in our lives, and in the world. He starts his sermon with what is often called the Beatitudes. And he speaks about eight blessings. And that word blessings is absolutely incredible. 
the blessing, the, the word blessing, it speaks so much more than just a, a, a happiness or a joy. It, 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 there's this, this, this bliss. There's this, you can read all, all sorts of commentaries on blessings. I thought maybe a good way to give explanation to what blessing means here is maybe to, to show you a bunch of words that is the opposite. So let's put up on the screen. These, this is not blessing. This, you might be able to relate to some of these words. Because we live in an upside down world. We live in a world that is contrary to the, God, the, the kingdom of God. Where he said blessed. In fact, let's read it. Let's read how it starts. I want to read the, the message, the paraphrase version of it. Matthew chapter th- 5 verse 3. You're blessed when you're at the end of the rope. Less of you, there's more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one that's most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever get. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind, your heart, put right, then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you to even, even deeper into God's kingdom. This is how the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever, starts. Over the next few months, I'm going to preach a message per blessing. But I want to start today with a bit of an overview, a bit of an introduction. This Sermon on the Mount, it's about living the way that we were created, the way of God's kingdom. It starts off about how to live blessed. And then it goes on and starts talking about living with integrity. Not about how good you look. Not about doing all the right things. Not about saying all the right things, but what's going on in your heart. It's about living with purpose. Being salt and light in the world for a purpose, for a mission. Living in a way that benefits others in the world that we live in. Looking at our own blind spots rather than judging others. Oh, that's a tough one, isn't it? Putting God first putting his ways first. It's the way of the kingdom of God. As we surrender to God, we surrender ourself to God and allow his love in our hearts. We sung about it this morning, open our hearts to God, letting his love come in. We find ourselves being healed. We find ourselves living with this wholeness, with this peace. We find ourselves living with this love with grace, with hope, with strength. And the way the sermon ends, he he says, even through the storms of life, your life will stand. Your life will stand strong as this being the way you live. It's interesting, the context of this sermon. As I said, it begins in Matthew chapter 5, but the context, we need to look a little bit broader. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, you see Jesus led out into the wilderness. And he's tempted. Just after he was baptized. Shout out to everyone getting baptized today. And then he goes out to the lake. He finds two sets of brothers. And to one of them, he says, come and follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Come follow me. Talking about discipleship. Come follow me. Be my disciple. Come follow me. Because I have a mission for you. My disciples have a mission. And the mission is to be fishers of men. Putting it in the language of the fishermen. By the end of the book of Matthew, by the end of the Gospels, in Matthew chapter 28, you see it put in different different words. Where he says, hey... All authority has been given to me. Now, I'm, I'm saying to you, go out into all the world and make disciples, baptizing. Oh, there it is again. Baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. 
and teach them to obey all my commandments. By the way, John summarized his commandments as believe in Jesus and love each other. So the context of this is Jesus has just said, hey, come follow me. Be my disciples. I've got a mission for you. And what he does is he goes around and he starts healing people, gathers these crowds around him. And then he goes up onto this mountain and he calls his disciples and says, hey, come here. Come, come. This is lesson, this is my view of it, lesson number one. The Bible doesn't say that. But it's like lesson number one on discipleship. Lesson number one on, on, on following me. Lesson number one on being fishers of men. And then he starts with the Beatitudes. He starts with this Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Then in chapter 8, chapter 9, you see him going out and he starts, he brings his disciples with him and he, and he, he demonstrates the power of the kingdom of God. He sees people healed. He sees all sorts of things happen. He teaches them about faith. Faith in the storms. Faith of the centurion. Faith. Teaches them about faith. He's demonst- it's a demonstration. And then by the end of chapter 9, he says, hey, all these people, you're going to be fishers of men. All these people are like sheep without a shepherd. Pray for that. You know, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Then straight after that, beginning in chapter 10, he says, now you're, the, you're going to go out. I'm going to send you out. Hey, internship, practicum. You've had the, le- you've had the theoretical lesson. You've had the demonstration. Lesson number three, you go out and do it. The greatest sermon ever given is in the context of Jesus training his disciples. It's a sermon on discipleship, about living God's way. And I'm telling you this because I think it's more important than we realize to understand that context. I think it's more important than we realize to understand about discipleship. Now, we speak about discipleship in church. We speak about discipling one another. But I, as I read the Bible, and I've been studying this a lot lately, I'd like to share with you what I've discovered. Because, see, I think our focus ought to be more on our discipleship with Jesus. I'll tell you what I mean. Let's, let's, maybe we can all get on the same page because when it comes to discipleship, some people make such a big deal about it, I, I believe in the wrong way. I, I've, I've asked the guys to just go to Bible Gateway and, and look, at some, look at some stuff. Let's, maybe on the screen, can we just put, we'll put, look for disciples in the Bible. Let's look for disciple in the Bible. So if we type in Bible Gateway, disciple. Okay, there's 296 times the Bible speaks about disciples, speaking about Jesus' disciples, John the Baptist's disciples. Let's look at discipleship. How many times is discipleship in the Bible? Dun-dun. It's not even in the Bible. They think it should be. Bible Gateway thinks it should be, so it gives another, a different type of uh, scripture, but it's not discipleship. It doesn't say discipleship. What about discipling? Because we should disciple, be discipling people, right? Dun dun. No results. It's not in there. Isn't that crazy? The word discipleship's not in the Bible. I'm not saying it's not important, I'm going to tell you it's very important. The word discipling is not in the Bible. So in all of the New Testament that says this is how we should be as the church, in all of the New Testament that says this is how we should relate to each other, not once does it use the word discipleship to describe it. Not once does the Bible use discipling to describe it. Isn't that amazing? I was staggered when I saw that. I was, I was blown away. Don't get me wrong. I think discipleship is vital, but maybe not the way that we thought about it in the past. Don't get me wrong, I don't think that what happens in the life of the church is unimportant. In fact, completely the opposite. I think it's more important than most people think. The Bible speaks a lot about loving each other, supporting each other, encouraging each other, caring for each other, making sure we keep meeting with each other. 
spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. The Bible speaks so much about being the family of God, being the church. In fact, it says that it goes way beyond that and says we belong to one another. We ought to live as disciples of Jesus, completely dependent on Jesus. We are disciples of Jesus. We are the ones that get discipled. He is the one that does the discipling. Our discipleship is not one with the other. Our discipleship is what happens between Jesus and us. The Holy Spirit empowers us and guides us in truth. We are to live dependent on Jesus, but when it comes to the mission of Jesus, we are to be completely interdependent. Completely dependent on Jesus, but completely interdependent as we live out the mission of Jesus. And if we don't focus on being discipled by He who is the discipler, we won't put the appropriate focus on our responsibility in that relationship. We won't put the appropriate focus on how Jesus disciples us. And we won't play our part or have our focus on our part in his mission as part of his plan. And we will not become fully mature. Now, some of you here have been in church for many years, and that goes against what you've been taught for many years. I want to encourage you to have a look for yourself. Look for the word discipleship in the Bible. Look for the word discipling in the Bible. I know you've got questions, and right now you're thinking, but hang on a minute. The Great Commission, you said it before. Jesus said, go and make disciples. That's right. That is right. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of age. Jesus tells us to make disciples. When have we made a disciple? It would be my question. When does someone move from not being a disciple to being a disciple? Very important that after that we baptize them. Very important that after that we teach them. Do you know that word for go and make disciples? In this study, I found it fascinating. Do you know that word for make disciples is only four times in the Bible? Uh, that word for make disciples, four times. It's only twice in the context of what Jesus is talking about. There's this time where there's the Great Commission, and the other one is in Acts chapter 14, 21. It says they preach the gospel in that city. They preach the gospel. The word, people who need the gospel are people who need to be saved. They preach the gospel in that city, and they won a large amount of disciples. There's that, that's where the word is the same word. It's the only other time in the same context. Now, in our traditional thought of discipleship, or if we're going to make disciples, that's a, that's a long process. But it doesn't seem to be that long. Because as soon as they did it, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. I wonder if making disciples is a lot to do with us being ministers of reconciliation, being fishers of men, being soul winners, seeing people get saved. And then what we do is together, we encourage each other, we support each other, we teach each other on the journey to maturity. On the journey to maturity. I don't think that's actually what Jesus is talking about here in discipleship, but I think the journey of maturity is something we support each other in as we mature in our discipleship with Jesus. Well, Richard, are you you're saying that teaching really, that's not discipleship and that's not really that important? No, no, I'm saying it's super important. I just don't see the Bible calling it discipleship. I see it calling it teaching. In 
In Acts chapter 11, verse 26, we see the importance of it. It's in the middle of this discussion about what's going on. He says they found him, they brought him to Antioch. For, so, uh, so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul, they met with the church and they taught great numbers of people. Teaching is important. The disciples, by the way, in other places, it talks about they're the Lord's disciples. The disciples, not, not Paul's disciples, not Saul's or Barnabas' disciples, the Lord's disciples. The disciples there were first called Christians. If you're a Christian, you're a disciple, a disciple of Jesus. It's important that we understand that. I, I think it, it matters in how we read the greatest sermon ever given. I think it matters when it comes to people coming to maturity. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 to 29, this is Paul. He says, Jesus is the one that we proclaim. We admonish. We, in other words, we warn people. And we teach everyone with all wisdom so that we can present everyone fully mature in Christ. Fully mature in Christ. And to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. This, this, this sense of once we become a disciple, now we mature. How do we mature? I'll read out two scriptures. One is in, you would have heard this before if you've been in church for a while, James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 2, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because that you know the testing of your faith, faith in who? Faith in what? Faith in Jesus. Faith in God. Because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And it's going to be tough. You're going to want to quit. But let perseverance finish its work if you want to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Stick it out in faith. Mature as disciples of Jesus. By the way, there's no mention there of anybody else in this situation. This is between you and God in your trials. Again, I think it's really important that we encourage each other, we love each other, we care for each other, we carry each other's burdens, that we be the church. That we, I think that's really important. But this, this maturity is in your maturity in your relationship with God, your faith that you persevere in. Another way the Bible speaks about coming to maturity is actually as the church. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Why? Why did, God give, why did Jesus gift people for that? To, to equip God's people, his disciples, for works of service. And the works of service are not to, not, he's not talking here about works of service in the workplace, in the charity, in, in anything. He's talking about so that the body of Christ might be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, mature, mature. Until we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And it talks about, it goes on and talks about, this is us, we're all building the church, the body of Christ up as each part does its work. We mature, it's faith in Jesus alone, working together for his mission. Any person been a Christian for a long time and thinks, this sounds really different to what I've heard before? I want to encourage you with fresh eyes. Let's read what the Bible says. We're going to start with the Beatitudes, the greatest sermon ever, ever told, and we're going to start at the beginning. It's important because Jesus is your discipler. What does he say? What's his lesson number one for you? If we don't understand discipleship, and the journey to maturity, we won't be presenting people mature in Christ. So we're going to spend some time on the Beatitudes. I'm looking forward to it. I've been studying this for a little while now. And I've got to tell you, I'm really excited about this, this, these next few months. I want to encourage you, commit yourself to saying, I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to come to hear the teaching about Jesus' word. 
See, we see, we get discipled by his word, we get discipled by the spirit, and we get discipled and encouraged. We, we get encouraged and supported, and we, we recognize there's a mission, there's a purpose. Come follow me, because I'm going to make you fishers of men. Here's the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. People who weren't disciples to be disciples. Baptize them. Teach them. Encourage them. As we work together in our journey to maturity, carrying out the mission of Jesus. Seven things to embrace. Really quickly. Because I'm not going to, I'm just going to read them out. Jesus wants us to live blessed. That's how the sermon starts. Blessed are those, 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 and blessed are those. So let's be those. We're blessed when we live in His design, number two. Number three, we live fully dependent on Jesus. Number four, but we live interdependent with each other as his church. Number five, Jesus is discipling us through his word and the Holy Spirit who guides us in truth. Number six, we take responsibility for our discipleship and our maturing. Number seven, we're on a mission. His mission, the cause of Christ, to testify to the truth, to see people get saved. I'm looking forward to this. As I said, I know there'll be a bunch of people watching right now. I want to encourage you. Rather than read the Bible from what people have taught you in the past, where you can really, you think, oh, discipleship is so important in the life of the church. We should be doing so much discipleship. And what does that mean, according to the Bible? I mean, the word's not in there. It's all about who I'm discipling. I mean, the Bible speaks so much about the church and how we're supposed to interact with each other, but it doesn't use that word. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from disciple and being disciples. It's important that we're being disciples. It's important that discipleship is happening, but it's happening between us and Jesus. We're not disciples of each other. We're disciples of Jesus. And Jesus has equipped, he's gifted us, a number of us, to equip the rest of us for works of service in the body of Christ, in the church. So, Next week, I'm going to do some teaching on Jesus' first lesson on discipleship. We get a seat at the table. Or maybe I should say a a seat on the patch of grass on the hill. And then we get to play our part in that journey where he shows us And then he says, now you go start putting this into practice. And when we live his way, we live blessed. It seems upside world to the world that we have grown up in. I believe as we actually go back to Jesus as as our discipler, I believe we're going to see maturity in the body of Christ. As we recognize that making disciples is making disciples, we're going to see more people come into the kingdom of God. More people become disciples, reliant on Jesus, but interdependent because we're on mission and the way he's designed that is for us to do it together interdependent 
kind of want to turn the page and go, let's go. Let's go. Lesson number one. <laughs> but we'll do that next week. But I encourage you, commit to it. Commit to this, this discipleship process with Jesus. And, uh, and let's go through this Sermon on the Mount. Let's go through these Beatitudes together. Come on, why don't we stand to our feet? Let's worship for a